I gather that the tradition of talking about movies in January, or at least as sermon material, started with Reverend um, Rob Oliphant. And it's an interesting challenge. How do you take a movie that was made for strictly the purposes of entertainment and make it into something that's relevant for a sermon? Well, this week we got really lucky. Um, it was John Suk's idea, actually, to say, well, instead of using Oscar movies this year, why don't we, from the past year, since it was a kind of terrible year for the movies, since we couldn't go to the theater, why not use movies from the past, since we've just celebrated our 75th anniversary? So today we're kicking that off with a film that won the Academy Award for Best Actress in 1945, um, and it's called Gaslight, same year that the church was established. And it's a prescient film in many ways uh, and does actually apply to our circumstances in this impossible week where on Wednesday we all witness something we never thought we would see in our lifetimes. But before I can get to how it helps us understand our position today, let me tell you a little bit about the film. Gaslight is the story of a husband's cruel psychological manipulation of his young wife. The husband, played by the debonair Charles Boyer, has married Paula, played by a young Ingrid Bergman. She's an orphan who's been raised by her aunt, a famous opera star, and they lived in a grand house in London. But when Paula was a teenager, she witnessed the murder of her aunt, yet the murderer was never found. Paula was whisked off to Italy, where she trains to become an opera singer over the next 10 years. There, Paula falls in love with a charming old man, older man, played by Boyer. But he insists after they get married, after a whirlwind romance, that they live in her aunt's home in London, despite her reluctance to return to the scene of the crime. Once in London and in that house, the husband seeks to undermine Paula's sense of self-confidence. He lies to her repeatedly about the reality of what's going on in the house. He plays mind games and tricks on her so that she starts to think she's losing her mind. As her self-confidence shatters, he refuses to let her leave the house, claiming that she's too mentally ill to go out. So she becomes utterly dependent on him. In the end, it's revealed that he was actually the man who murdered his, her aunt. He was there to steal some jewels, and he's come back to the house to find them. Paula is eventually rescued by an agent from Scotland Yard who's figured out the ruse and restores her confidence in her senses. Ingrid Bergman's performance earned her an Academy Award for Best Actress in 1945 the same year this church opened. Most films fade away and are forgotten, but not this one. After the film came out, psychoanalysts adopted the term gaslighting to describe this particular form of psychological manipulation. It is most often seen in relationships where an abusive spouse wants to destroy his partner's self-confidence so he can gain control over her. The goal is to render her powerless, devoted to him and his abuse. In recent years, this form of psychological abuse has been updated for our technological age. Many new homes are now equipped with smart appliances, uh, machines that can be remote controlled from your phone. Lights and furnaces can be turned, off, turned on and off remotely. However, for abused women in a home, this can become a form of torture as lights suddenly go on and off, sound systems come on with blaring loud music, furnaces can be turned up to 100 degrees. Women come to doubt their own sense of reality since all these strange things are happening in the house. This is called digital gaslighting, and it's being reported by police uh, law enforcement officers people who work in women's shelters who hear these strange stories and figure out what's going on. And some women have even been admitted for a mental health examination because they've been manipulated this way. The key to understanding gaslighting 
is that it's a form of deception that seeks to undermine its victim's ability to reason. So they will become totally dependent on the abuser's power and the abuser's version of reality. In the film, Paula becomes utterly dependent on her husband. And it's this aspect of gaslighting which has given it a new lease on life in our time. Over the past few years, our entire society has been told that it cannot trust its collective sense of reality. Russian bots have flooded the internet with falsehoods, salting our social media with lies. If you're on Facebook, you, like me, probably receive every week or so a friend request from someone you've never heard of, often in a country far, far away. These are usually fake people, the creations of bot farms. They hope that you'll click on like and become their friend so they can start flooding your social media feed with falsehoods in the interests of undermining our democracy. The lies don't even have to be consistent from week to week. They just have to make it hard to believe anyone else. They create a fog of confusion. The best example of a modern gaslighter is the 45th president of the United States, Donald J. Trump. He has spent years undermining Americans' trust in the press, decrying mainstream journalists as peddlers of fake news. And if their news is fake, well then, whose news is true? in the mind of the president who spreads his own twisted version of reality every day from his Twitter feed until it was canceled this week, Trump is the only one who can be trusted. He is asking his followers to just believe his version of reality and not trust anyone else. Trump's daily doses of lies have been driving the press mad, just like Paula was driven to the edge of insanity by her abusive husband. How could a president lie so brazenly, so often? How could he even contradict himself week after week and then have the gall to deny that he was lying? Politicians have always lied. There's nothing new about that. They lie about their intentions, about who they're negotiating with, even about where they've gone on vacation during a pandemic. Lying seems to be just a tool in their toolbox. Up until recently, the sorts of of untruths and and the sort of perspective which politicians fed to us was usually fairly consistent. People on the right would argue that the market is the cure to all of society's ills, while people on the left would say, no, actually, we should all be sharing uh, society's resources. These are called ideologies. They're a consistent set of ideas, a worldview which politicians asked us to endorse. And usually when they lie, it's within that world. And sometimes they're taken to task for having contradicted the worldview which they've endorsed. Gaslighting is different. It's all about getting complete power over the victim. And to do so, being inconsistent in your lies is actually works to undermine their sense of reality. So in that sense, it's totally different from the way ideology used to work. Trump contradicts himself all the time, even lies about lying. Like a confused robot in a science fiction film, all of us have been walking around going, does not compute, does not compute, does not compute. But this strategy has worked, as we saw on Wednesday. Trump's most ardent followers no longer trust the press to provide factual information. Instead, They just listen to what Trump and his followers say, like an abused wife convinced that only her manipulative husband can help her. His followers have believed his false idea that he won by a landslide and that the election was rigged. On Wednesday, thousands of aggrieved men and women followed Trump's instructions to march down Pennsylvania Avenue to disrupt the Senate and Congress as they sought to ratify Biden's win. It was a deplorable act for which Trump should be charged as an enemy of the state. 
As the armed insurrectionists invaded the Capitol and Senate, uh, the Capitol building, President-elect Biden appeared on television. He sounded and acted the way we expect and hope presidents will act. He condemned the violence and the assault on democracy. He asked the president to go on television to tell his thugs to back off and to condemn the violence. But he also made a statement that I find problematic. He said, quote, for nearly two and a half centuries, we, the people, in search of a more perfect union, have kept our eyes on that common good. This is the United States of America. There's never, ever, ever been a thing we've tried to do that we've done it together. We've not been able to do it. Biden argued that the real America has always acted in a unified way as one nation. And that is what has allowed it to face its biggest challenges. I'm glad that Biden spoke out on Wednesday, but I respectfully disagree with his idea of America as a united nation and that it always has been. That simply flies in the face of the facts. America is a nation founded by white Europeans who pushed indigenous people off their land. Today, most indigenous Americans live in the Southwest in a very arid area on reservations. America fueled its economic growth through the enslavement of Africans, a system which lasted for hundreds of years. And that system did not end in, with the Civil War. In 1876, the Americans had their last big dust up over a dispute over the electoral college system. In that year, white politicians from the South made a deal with white politicians from the North. The Southern politicians said, you know what? Our president was legally elected. That's what the Electoral College says. But we're willing to let him lose if you will agree to take the federal troops out of the South. And they did. The loser became the president. And the South was able to reinstate all sorts of racist laws and practices on the black people who lived there, issuing, initiating the Jim Crow system, which lasted right until the 1960s. And as this summer's Black Lives Matter protest demonstrated, racism lives on within police departments and society in both the United States and Canada. America has never really been a United States of America. Because in practice, one group, white straight men, have been in charge at the expense of everyone else who differed from them. White supremacy is not a fringe belief, but has been the mainstream operating system for American society since its inception. Wednesday's insurrection was launched by people who believe that straight white men are losing control over the country and they want to get power back. They want America to be great again, which means that white straight men should be in charge of it all. The insurrectionists who invaded the Capitol building on Wednesday carried Confederate flags, symbols of the Southern slavery era. The insurrectionists hung nooses on scaffolding outside the Capitol building a symbol of lynchings. And their message wasn't just about race, it was also about the rights of straight men to be in charge. Hours before they invaded the Capitol building, Donald Trump Jr. was speaking to the, the assembled insurrectionists, and he went off, he, would, he said sort of obvious things about your patriots, this election was rigged, my father won by a landslide, and then he went off into this strange tangent. And he started decrying trans women athletes. And he took to task the federal funding of gender studies. Why would he do that? What's that got to do with election fraud? Well, it's got everything to do with saying to the men in that crowd, we all know who real men are. 
later on, once the insurrectionists made a point of going in, and once inside, the insurrectionists made a point of going inside Nancy Pelosi's office, where they left a note on her desk saying, we will not back down. It was a clear warning to the woman who dares to oppose Trump and what he stands for. This insurrection aimed to interrupt the peaceful transfer of power, but it's fueled by a racist, sexist sense of who should be in charge of America. Biden is wrong. America has not been united, and Trump's followers know it. The difference is that Biden represents people who say they want to put white male supremacy behind us, into the past, while Trump's followers want to restore it. This battle is being waged at the level of governments and in the press, but that's not really where the battle will be won. Since the 1960s, laws have been passed outlawing racial and sexual discrimination, but the prejudice persists. The beliefs that fuel racism and sexism and homophobia persist even when they're illegal in their application. In the presidential election, 46% of the electorate voted for Trump. On Wednesday night, one quarter of all members of Congress voted to say that the, they believed that the election was fraudulent. Clearly, civil rights laws alone do not change minds. The values we hold dear, the ones we act on, they're learnt in our homes around our kitchen tables. They're reinforced in bars as we get together with friends to shoot the breeze and among plain folks like us at church gatherings. The root of this problem, it's not in the Senate, it's not in the White House, Parliament, or even Queen's Park. Politicians who succeed encouraging hatred and fear are just fanning the flames which are already out there. If we're to defeat the forces that led to Wednesday's insurrection, it will be at the level of society that laws can't reach. It's among our friends and family. That's where beliefs take hold and are passed down to our children. So what can, our, what can we as a church do? We can follow the advice contained in Paul's letter to the Romans. He advises his fellow Christians not to hate their enemies, to, but to pray for them. Generating heart, hate within our hearts is part of the problem. It actually matters quite a lot how we feel. And that's hard work. Hatred is way easier than being understanding. Paul also encourages his friends to associate with everyone, not just their in-group. Christians are not supposed to be a secret society. We can and should talk with anyone. But to Paul, it's clear that Christians have a different agenda from the one that rules what he would call the world, what we would call society. It's not our job to always be on the defensive, just reacting to whatever the forces of evil and hatred are doing at any particular moment in time. Our mandate, our mission statement, if you will, is to be loving with each other and everyone else, even those we don't agree with. Our job is to spread a message of love and work for a better, more just society, even when others would rather go backwards. Here at Lawrence Park, we've been trying to do that work. We've been helping out people at the Roehampton shelter which is not a popular thing to do. That shelter, lots of people in our neighborhood believe it shouldn't even exist. So we've been helping them, working to put together gift baskets, welcome baskets rather, so that when they move out of the shelter and they move into an apartment, they'll have all the stuff that they need. We've also been helping youth who have run away from home and have become homeless by providing meals to Eva's Place, a youth shelter in the city. And we've started the Affirm process last year, where we're doing everything we can to be, make our church welcoming and open to those who come in, no matter what their race, gender, sexual orientation, 
or culture is. And that's great. But affirming is actually more than just being welcoming. Imagine going to a dinner party in a country whose customs are very different from our own. The people at the dinner party eat food you don't recognize, they use utensils in a different way, and the courses seem all mixed up. The hosts are warm and welcoming, but they can see that you're just completely bewildered. You don't know how to have dinner this way. They notice and they ask you why. And you explain how we eat here in Canada and how it's different. They crinkle their brow, express surprise. Some even look spontaneously a little disdainful. That's weird. This is all news to them. But they're still welcoming. They feed you, and they even invite you back for dinner another day. And you go. But every time you go, they mention how different you are. And you have to explain yourself. And it just gets tiresome. So after a while, you stop going. They're nice people. You're a nice person. They gave you dinner. That's great. But it just became too tiresome to always have to explain yourself because they didn't know enough about you. We don't want to be the people who act with surprise at someone else's lifestyle or identity. The way to avoid that is to take some time to get to know about the lives of people who are different from you. Different in terms of sexuality or gender, race, culture, physical or mental ability. And that's what the Affirm Committee is trying to do this year in 2021. They'll be hosting discussion nights about race and gender and sexuality and other forms of identity which may be different from your own. These nights will use movies and books to explore multiple ways of living and being, to give you a chance to live in someone else's shoes for a little while and then talk about it. This is a chance to learn about the lives of others and to realize that some of our spontaneous reactions, like the people at that dinner party, like, really? Huh? Those are actually the product of what's being implanted in us in a culture which has been ruled by white supremacy for a really long time, and we've just inherited it along the way. We f may find that we too have been gaslighted by our culture, trusting in our ways and suspicious of the ways of others. We've been isolated into a particular kind of worldview. It's time to break that dependency. And the best way to do it is to end our isolation. It worked for Paula in the movie, and it can work for us too. If we're to avoid the chaos which erupted this week in the United States, regular people like us will have to work, do the work to understand all the varieties of people that God has created and to love them as we love each other. As Paul says in the scripture reading that Susan read for us, avoid thinking that you are better than others or wiser than the rest. Instead, embrace common people. Let us be the ones who embrace understanding and end our isolation. In doing so, we will be rewarded with a richer sense of what it means to be a human being and will be amazed at the wonderful diversity that God has created in humanity. Amen.